So it's an update time, and this is a little bit of a filler video, a little bit of an update on some of the projects, and a little bit forward-looking. And the reason why I wanted to do this is I missed my target of hitting one video a week last week. And what I found out is that it's actually really, really difficult to hit that target, especially when there's conceptualization, design, building stuff, testing it, and then recording it all into one project. So I'm thinking on and trying to add in a few more critiques of things happening in the industry, marketplace, or some just tech background stuff, some just simple whiteboard stuff. Stuff that I can shoot and edit in a day. Uh, what I want to talk about today for update side of things is the Maelstrom Fan Controller. So, like with most Kickstarter projects, people really hate the lack of transparency. So, I'm going to be as transparent as I can. Um, I haven't fully made a decision whether to scrap it and go full open source and let people just buy some hardware or if I'm going to still go the market route. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the cost of this project. So I don't have a thousand pre-orders yet. I have way more than I expected. And most of them, um, you know, a lot of them have actually said they talk about group orders for their groups or cycling studios. So right now, uh, this is actually an estimate cost. It's actually cost uh, about $1.80 per click to the site. It's about a 6% conversion rate from getting to the site, seeing the hero, seeing the description and clicking pre-order and then being, aha, it's actually an email list. Um, natural marketing costs, it's going to build a few prototypes here and then mail them out, make sure everything's working. Um, probably a few back and forths on shipping and shipping is very expensive. Circuit board, not too expensive. Using a module drives up the cost, but it's a bit of a pain in the butt. It might actually have to go up depending on the level of electrical isolation I want right now. AC fully isolated. Um, the low voltage stuff is not. It's using a circuit that is kind of common to a lot of this stuff. But I mean, I've looked at a lot of these LED lights and frankly, their circuits in them to reduce the voltage are uh, death traps. They're total fire hazards, and some of them say UL, but I don't believe half of them. So plastics um, is a per unit price, but it requires a tool. Uh, tooling will cost about $3,000 if I do a soft tool. So this is a little less accurate. It um, Over time, it gets more inaccurate because there's a greater amount of wear, but it's also higher unit costs on the plastics. And then Assembly. I can't actually assemble these myself if I want um, UL, CSA, or ETL certification. So for wireless, uh, pretty cheap certification using a module. But for CS saying CSA here, and that's kind of the quotes I've got back now, it's about eight to twelve thousand dollars. It's actually more like eight to ten. But in order to have them review the design before I request certification. And it's about $2,000. But they want to certify the design and the manufacturing. So in order to do the manufacturing, I have to have an ISO certified manufacturer. And then they want to inspect it quarterly. So once we amortize those one-time costs, it's about $20 a unit. The hard costs, um, so these are the per unit prices. And I'm including this marketing one here, which is driving it up. But yeah, it's uh, 5650. So at, I think the site says 69 US dollars. There's there's really only 15 dollars a margin in there. So even at a thousand units, like the amount of engineering is not even close to being covered. But it's an out of pocket upfront cost from me before I sell anything in in this you know fully certified guise of fifty thousand dollars. If we move over to the high volume version, let's just go up to 10,000 units. A lot of these things change. Let's hope the marketing goes down. Natural marketing or organic marketing costs go up. PCB goes down. Hard tool goes way up because we're no longer soft tool because we're, we'd blow out a soft tool. You'd actually have to have about five or six of them. Plastic prices go down. Assembly about the same. Um, it might go down a little, but we're splitting here. CSA or... UL and FCC stuff also is the same with the modules and now we're down to a much more reasonable cost but 
it's a quarter million dollars and I can tell you I can't jump to that and I uh, so to hit this yeah um, probably not gonna be able to touch it to hit this is even a even a bit of a stretch so I'm looking at a uh, a way around this right now uh, to try and drive this down further to make it actually feasible but uh, I don't have that finalized yet the Zwift weight trainer thing I've used it a few times it's actually really cool but i don't know where to go with it and if you haven't seen it it's a great video to go back to but it didn't seem to hit or resonate with the audience and i think the solutions to these problems are less engaging and less interesting than the controversy surrounding the problem so uh, the reverse engineering of di2 i did the reverse engineering part i've actually got that pretty solid now I'm porting it into a microcontroller. And that's been a little bit hit or miss a couple of times. Uh, essentially, I've had to rewrite a lot of libraries in order to make things work the way I want. But it's coming along, so I actually have a little bit of a demo for that. So I'm just going to go in here and add a Shimano DI2. We'll go to add sensor, scroll down to Shimano DI2. There we are. We'll hit it's searching for them. Uh, there's no other DI2 systems on. Uh, I only have one and it's battery disconnected. So I'll turn on the dev board to show that it's the dev board connecting. You can see the light turned on. And after a few seconds, yes, we've got a Shimano DI2 system. So it's going to pop up any second now about configuring the, oh, there it is, configure the buttons. So the defaults have all the functions mapped to the same previous page or next page for the right button. So we'll just switch that up to start and stop timer for the left. And on the right side, we'll switch the press and hold to record lap. So you'll be able to see the difference. I'll just go into my indoor profile and I'll start by changing the page a few times. I'm going to go the other way, back and forth. I'm going to press and hold for the long, and uh, got to start. Press and hold, recorded a lap. Press and hold, record another lap. Press and hold, should stop. And press and hold will continue. So. Uh, that button's not mapped to the thing I think it is, but this one you can see it's changing the gears. Uh, some of the buttons are, are mapped to do a couple of things. Forward looking, what have I been working on? So there's a revision of that PCB used for um, capturing all the strain gauge data from the, the little weight scale feet load cells. So there's a revision of that. I'm hoping that that'll end up on something like Tindy. So you've probably noticed that there's two bikes kind of in my little experimental office lab here. Um, and both of them actually have Campagnolo ETS, even though the, the frames are actually almost exactly 30 years apart. The Campagnolo system uses a large charger like this, and it's, it's versatile, it's electrically isolated, it's very safe. You can take uh, EU, UK, uh, Japan, Canadian voltages, or 12 volts DC into the barrel jack boost that up to the necessary voltage to charge the three cell system in the ETS. Shimano Altegra actually came with this very small, nice and sleek, but it's a USB based charger. So while a little more convenient, um, obviously it's slower charging speeds, but it's much smaller, it's much more convenient to travel with this than with this big thing. So I'm looking at a circuit that will boost USB voltage from 5 volts to um, about 13, probably 14 volts. And then I'll use a linear or a, uh, a buck type charging uh, regulator that's designed for three cell lithium systems. The other thing you'll notice is this has a long cable, whereas the Campagnolo system has a very short cable. I've actually built an extension for this and you can actually by the under seat cable and use as an extension. Um, I use it so that I can leave the charger on the floor and just run a cable up to the bike. Uh, but this 
really actually doesn't need it because it's so small and light, I can hang it off the, the bike anywhere. But the extra cable length is very convenient. So uh, that's kind of the goal is to create something about this size to replace this, but running off of USB. And uh, it'll end up something like likely on Team B or, or something like that. This cable is actually rather expensive. Um, so that is actually the bulk of the cost. This, this cable is actually about a three to one cost over all of the circuits required to do this. That's pretty much it for the forward looking projects. Might do a couple of quick videos related to probably some of the existing hacks that I've already done with my Campanile EPS systems, especially on my wheelier. Uh, the wheelier was a very difficult frame to bind at all anywhere and very expensive. So I didn't want to drill any holes in it, but yet I've got a 30 year difference between when my group set was built and when the frame was built. So trying to find solutions to drilling holes and routing cables and just uh, moving things about where I wanted. I was okay with drilling a hole in my seat post because it was aftermarket, but I also had to do some soldering in order to actually mount the battery, some uh, cable extensions in order to make the EPS system work. So. It was really kind of cool to do. Um, one of my favorite bikes that I've ever had, one that I probably will never sell for the rest of my life, especially if I can maintain the paint job. Uh, but with that, thanks for watching. Hopefully next week I'll have something a little more substantial on where I'm going with some of this stuff. And uh, if you care, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. Um, with that, thanks.